Hi and welcome to episode 41 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. If this is the first episode you're listening to at the Page One Podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, the process, how they broke into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. We've got a good collection of uh, past episodes now. There's a lot of great authors with a lot of great advice and screenwriters uh, and various other kinds of writers as well. People like David Baldacci, Joe Cornish, David Quantic recently, uh, Andy McNabb, Sarah Pimbra. So yeah, there's a big selection. So do check that out if this is your first episode. Um, but we've got a great guest this week, Tarek. We do have a great guest. This week we are chatting with Paul Tremblay, who you may know from his horror genre books. He's written a whole number of them. Uh, a Head Full of Ghosts was probably the one that really launched him um, into the kind of stratosphere it got a nice little push from Stephen King which is always a very nice push to have yeah we, we speak to Paul about that and his, his most recent book is getting a lot of buzz about it and we've yeah. actually had the chance to read it as well and it is great it's a survivor okay. song which is about a sort of small outbreak uh, in uh, Massachusetts is it I think um, uh, but of a sort of rabies type disease but it's, it's you know it grabs you from the opening it's got a very Builds, unsettling. Yeah, exactly. Unsettling. Builds a great sense of dread. And we speak to him about how you sort of create that sort of atmosphere in writing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a great episode. So we'll get on with that and we'll be back at the end of the podcast to let you know about next week's guest as well. Uh, because although we normally only have 10 episodes a season, we've got a bonus episode this season. And so, what a bonus episode. And what a bonus episode, exactly. And there is a link to Paul Tremblay as well, but we'll reveal it at the end <laughs> of the podcast. Um, so we'll get on with it and uh, we'll just leave you the quick advert for our writer's notebook, uh, also called Page One, and then we'll get straight into the interview. On with the show. The Blank Page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, Every story starts with page one. I read in an interview that you didn't enjoy reading as a child and you wanted to be a basketball player. Is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, as a, you know, as a kid, you know, like becoming a writer was like the furthest thing from my imagination. Um, I was a big sports fan, even though like I wasn't very athletic and I was also like really short and skinny. <laughs> So it was more like, you know, just a sports fan from yeah. afar. Uh, yeah, I, um, it is strange. Like I know, almost every writer I talk to clearly like grew up reading and maybe most of them even grew up writing. And 
you know, I would read for school, but like reading for pleasure just wasn't wasn't something I really did. I, would, I came home and watched a lot of TV. <laughs> that sounds lame, but you know, watched a lot of movies. But I didn't really come to reading until my early twenties, or I should say, I really didn't come to reading for pleasure until my early twenties. Mm -hmm. And was it? I think it said said in the interview as well that you you were bedridden and first read Stephen King, and was that a sort of pivotal moment for you? Uh, so the first time I tried reading, like really reading King, I was 18 and I just had a major back surgery. I had a spinal fusion. Mm -hmm. So I had scoliosis as a child, you know, curvature of the spine. Yeah. You know, and I was going to spend the whole summer, you know, convalescing at home. So I was like, well, I got the time, you know, I might as well maybe read a book. And <laughs> my parents had it sitting on their bookshelf. So I took it out, read the first chapter, and like literally the only time I've thrown a book across the room, like. There's no way I'm going to read this book. It was too scary. I was going to be alone by myself in a house. Just out of my mind. <laughs> so that was the first time. And then the second time, um, my I just graduated college. Um, I was tw you know, for my 22nd birthday. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, bought me the stand. And like maybe a month prior to that, I, I had ended up taking uh, an, uh, an English literature class. My last semester in college, almost randomly, and in that class. You know, I really connected with the professor because he was into punk music and so was I. And um, I don't know, the, the stories he gave us to read just sort of blew me away. Like, I didn't know people wrote things like that. And that really sort of, mm -hmm. that was like the first light. And really the first story that did that to me was Joyce Carol Oates' Where Are You Going, Where Are You Been? Which I read for that class. And I'll never forget reading that and going, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know these things, this, something like this was out there. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, reading The Stand, you know, hooked me for life for reading, to reading. And then, so from reading, how how did that develop into a, a desire to tell your own stories? Um, so, I, I mean, I, so around the same time, I guess I discovered, you know, I had sort of a, a want for some sort of creative outlet. You know, and the first thing I tried was playing guitar and writing music. Um, as a, you know, as a child, I was a big music fan. And if I wasn't watching TV, I was sitting with the stereo i was laying on the floor with the stereo speakers tented over my head listening to music and imagining i was playing those songs so while i was in graduate school and even when i started getting my first teaching job i was like oh, i really want to be a musician i play guitar <clears throat> um at the same time when i was reading all these books i started you know i i started getting like these you know weird little ideas to try writing for a short story so i would say from like 1995 to 2000 I was definitely a very much a hobbyist writer, you know, and I don't mean that as an insult, but I just meant like I wasn't doing it every day. I might mm -hmm. do it when the mood struck, you know, so I wrote like a, you know, maybe a few short, not a few, probably maybe like 10 short stories in those five years or something like that. Um, but I eventually figured out I was a better writer than musician, much to my, much to my disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so then I just, you know, put all my energies into writing stories, probably and, around like 2000. And, and how, oh. Where did you turn to to actually get these 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 works out there? You know, is, am I right in saying was it kind of magazines or was there places online that you would share them and stuff? Um, so like the, the first stories I ever wrote, like in terms of like getting help from other people, it was just people in my family. Like my so Lisa that I mentioned already, she was an English major, so she was really my first editor. You know, I was a math, I had a master's in math. What did I know about <laughs> English? Um, and, you know, I have uh, a cousin and his husband were my first readers for a long time. My aunt and her wife were my first readers and, you know, people that I love, but I also trust enough that they would, you know, be critical. They just wouldn't say, hey, you know, this is great every time, you know, they would tell me what they thought. Um, I don't know it's sort of those, I don't say the early days of the internet, but, <laughs> you know, late 90s, 2000s, obviously the internet was there, but it wasn't like, you know, there's certainly no social media, so... Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was so, I mean, it was so hard for me to, to write. Like I knew right away, there's no way I'm giving away a story for free. I just, I, I, <laughs> I put too much work into it. You know, even if it was like $10, I'm going to get paid something for it. Mm -hmm. So I did, I think the first thing I did was I sent away, it might've even been like writer's digest to, you know, looking for hard copies of lists of markets. And eventually those lists started migrating online. Um, and I ended up joining the horror writers association, probably around like 2000, 2001. So that was really the first time I was hooked into a community. You know, they had a message board that I would read pretty frequently. So other writers would talk about, you know, here's the paying markets and here are what editors are looking for. So that's how I started slowly 
you know, finding out and figuring out how to, you know, where to, where to submit stories. So you, you, you started getting the short stories out there, but when did you make that decision to say, right, I'm going to try and go for a full length, uh, a novel length type story? Um, I actually tried one in what I would call that hobby time in the mid nineties. It was a really terrible novel, very much a Stephen King knockoff. Um, but I mean, it was worth doing, you know, it ended up, it ended up like 60,000 words, but you know, it's hard because, you know, when you write a short story and it doesn't sell, it's easy to put it away. Mm -hmm. You know, when you write a novel and you spend so much time on it, you know, I understand it's very difficult to be like, well, the lesson was that I actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> which is the truth. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You know, which is, which is the truth, but I understand, you know, that's difficult. And I'm, I'm very glad that I don't, I'm not coming, but I'm not becoming a new writer today because I know the, the temptation just to self publish everything right away would, would, would be hard to deny because mm -hmm. it's so easy to do. But I'm, I'm, for me, I'm very glad I didn't because again, those early <laughs> stories make me cringe. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think, you know, the patience paid off. I learned from rejection. You know, I would take what editor or what editors or what or whoever critiqued my stories, I would I would take that information and you know and try just to write the next thing better. So you know, I mean, even when I, when I sold my first novel in two thousand seven, it was really like the fourth and a half that I'd written. Mm -hmm. um, but but what what I was gonna ask was th that is a difficult thing, you know, for, for people that are starting out and they've spent you know, months writing a novel length thing and then it gets rejected, you know, is there, there's a lot of temptation, I think, for a lot of people to say, well, maybe if I just tweak it, maybe if I keep, and you know, they kind of get stuck on right. that first novel and can't get past it. Um, so, you know, how, how did you know, or is it just a sort of instinct thing to just say, right, okay, that one didn't work. I'm going to start completely afresh and move on. Um, you know, I, I tried to give like every book like a chance, like mm -hmm. that first crappy Stephen King novel that I wrote. Um, you know, I, I, I never show, I didn't get to show it to any others, but I, I pitched it once and I think I, I definitely sent it out to like agents and stuff, but never got anything close to a nibble. So I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to put that away. Um, then I got through like maybe half a book, but it just stopped working. So I gave up on it. I wrote another book that I knew was just so bizarre that I put it away. I eventually published it later with a small publisher, but um, then the first one I felt like, okay, you know, I'm really, I mean, I feel like this is pretty good. Um, I wrote this novel called Phobia in 2004, 2004, 2005. Um, and it's not a horror novel. It's almost like a quirky plotless comedy set in Boston about a character who has all these like bizarre fears sort of humorous fears, including like the fear of the inability to complete simple tasks. So it was just like basically him going from set piece to set piece of ridiculous yeah. things happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I felt pretty good about it. Um, even though at that point in my writing life, I was still definitely feel like uh, still mimicking like writers that I liked. You know, I think the voice in that book is very much Chuck Palahniuk because I just discovered him. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but you know, I spent two years and I didn't give up looking for an agent with that book. Um, and I felt like I got close. A few, I definitely got close a few times. I got quite a few. Hey, this look, sounds interesting. Let me see the full manuscript. Mm -hmm. So I had a bunch of those. And then I would also get like, wow, this is really original and funny. We just don't know who to sell it to, which was very frustrating. But also, OK, I felt like, OK, this means I think I wrote something that's, you know, worthy of, of publication, even yeah. if it doesn't get published. Yeah. Um, and I eventually got my agent, Stephen. And the funny part was one of the, he worked for Donald Moss at the time. I think one of the first agencies I sent it to like was Donald Moss. And I think Donald Moss himself rejected it. You know, flash forward like a, a year and a half later, you know, I sent out like the 200th query, <laughs> uh, you know, looking through the, you know, online agents yeah. listings and, and, and printed out, you know, or hard copy agent listings. I, I sent an email to the, uh, to a woman I, I, that was new to me that I hadn't seen on any lists. And then my, my agent Steven responds like, Hey, she doesn't work here anymore, but I'd like to see it. And for some reason, like it wasn't there originally, but it's like, Oh, he works with Donald Moss. And I'm like, Oh, I've already been rejected by them. <laughs> Should I send it? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to send it anyway. You know, when Steven was great, he was like, you know, I think you're very talented. You know, I, he said, I think this will be a hard sell, but I think you're very talented. I want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And 
so we, we, we did not sell that novel. Like he, you know, we sent it to a bunch of places and, you know, we had a tough conversation. He was like, look, you know, we could maybe sell this to a smaller publisher, but I, I would rather you write another novel and then we can, so we can go back to a big publisher. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was kind of hard to, to take, you know, our relationship was new, but you know, I, I, I thought about it for a while and took his advice and the, the next novel I wrote, we did end up selling to, to Henry Holt. Sorry, that was a big rambly answer to, I'm sure, a shorter question. <laughs> no, 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 that, that was, it's good to hear that process. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds like it must have been a, a really, it is tough. Is it? I, I can imagine when you get told by someone, you know, you've spent all this time writing this book and then you're told, oh, it's, you know, it's very strange, but it's, it's a very good book and you're a very good writer, but this isn't the right book. And having yeah. to say, okay, I'm going to start from scratch. That, that's almost else. more frustrating than yeah. just not, like people just not taking it on in the first place, saying this is good, but yeah, it's still not yeah. going to work. Just tell me it's crap, and I'll go on. And <laughs> yeah, <think exactly>. it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, well, I mean, I think if I, I if I kept hearing that this was crap, I would have been totally discouraged. So, in some ways, the feedback I was getting was like, "This is good," and it's so like I always felt like, "Ah, it's so close; it just needs to be, yeah, you mm-hmm. know, push one more spot." So, I mean, that just sort of just sort of kept me going. And um, then, you know, as frustrating your... as it was. And then your your next book was was that the little sleep was that the book it was you made? yes okay. and and so what what I mean how did you decide okay so the book I'd written the phobia book wasn't right how did you work out what the right book was uh, you know I wasn't sure what the right book was I just happened to have an idea for that novel um, that it seemed like a good idea and you know I told my agent Stephen at the time he's like hey I've got this idea for this strange uh, detective novel and. You know, so again, I, I was very much, you know, a young, newer writer, and he was a sort of a newer agent too, which is kind of fun. We both sort of like grown together, because <laughs> Stephen is still my agent, which is kind of rare in this industry. You know, Stephen and I, I guess, have had a 14 year now professional relationship. Wow, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I told him about my idea for the little sleep. He's like, "That's great," <laughs> and have, having read some of my other stuff, he's like, "Why don't you write a 10 page summary first before you start writing the book?" Because most of the stuff I've been sending them him had been this plotless stuff. You know, I've always felt like I've been most comfortable writing about, you know, I'm, I guess I'm most comfortable with voice and character and plot for me is the hardest. So he was like, hey, why don't you try writing a summary first and then write the book? You know, because especially <laughs> it was going to be a mystery, you know, you, you need a plot and a mystery. So, I mean, that was wonderful advice. Um I, I do that for most of the novels that I write now. I write a summary first, but I don't always. I haven't done that for every book. But yeah, it was weird. Like after like, you know, years of, you know, agent rejections and all these no's, like from the start of The Little Sleep to selling it was like incredibly fast. I started it in April of 2007. I spent that month writing the summary, finished the book in late August of 2007. I mean, by far the quickest I've ever written any yeah. novel. And we sold them a month later. Wow, that is fast. It yeah. is that sort of thing that we've heard we, uh, previous guests have sort of called it like being break ready sort of thing. You sort of work yourself up to that moment where it seems to then suddenly happen quickly, but you've got all this work in the background uh, that, that, that's got you to that position. I'm going to jump forward a bit to Head Full of Ghosts, um, which had a big impact and you had someone that you'd read tweeting about it, um, Stephen <laughs> King. Saying that it scared the hell out of him. How how did that uh, how did that make you feel? Oh, uh, I mean, it remains like one of the top three professional moments of my life. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Because I mean, I I'd sent him a book. Like I didn't, I had no relationship with him prior to that tweet. Um, you know, I had contact with his assistant. You know, and she's like, hey, you know, you can send a book, but like he has an office with like hundreds, maybe even like a thousand books on the wall. Mm-hmm. I'll walk through and sometimes pick one out. She's like, you know, so odds are <laughs> he's not going to get to the book. I'm like, that's <laughs> fine. Um, but then I, you know, so the book came out in the first week of June in, in 2015. Um, and I had a couple of, you know, uh, friends, acquaintances in the writing community who are friends with Stephen. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I had told him like, hey, you know, I read this book. You should really read it. It's great. So I think it was because of the, it was definitely because of the, uh, recommendations from the two friends of his that he ended up reading it. Um, and yeah, August 19th, 2015. <laughs> I have a tattoo across my chest. Um, 
yeah, you know, the book had been out for almost three months now. And um, I was just home. We bought like a new dining room table. So I was moving furniture and it was really hot out. I was cranky. Um, school was around the corner. So like I get like school to children, I get depressed when September rolls around. Um, that's what's, <laughs> that's when we start school again in the U S um, yeah. And then my phone just started going crazy because my friends had seen him tweet before I did. So when I read the tweet, you know, I got teary eyed. I started reading because of Stephen King, never mind writing. Mm-hmm. So I stopped, um, I stopped doing whatever, you know, moving furniture. I just opened my laptop and grabbed like a six pack of beer out of the fridge and had like a one, had a one man party <laughs> just, just <laughs> the rest of the night watching people react. To the and stuff. That must have been absolutely like, a, yeah, I mean, that must have been an incredible moment just to have that. And, and, and what impact did that have going forward with the book? Did that, did that make, do you see that impact, that tweet having a massive impact in sales, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. I'd say it's immeasurable. I mean, you know, the book was definitely critically well received. Um, you know, it sold okay, I think, in those initial months, but you know, it wasn't crazy off the shelves. But no, I that tweet, like how he worded it, you know, a handful of ghosts scared the living hell out of me. I'm not easy to scare. I think just resonated with people because you know he recommends books all the time. I don't think every tweet that he puts out there gets sort of the reaction that yeah. that one got. Um, no, I mean it's immeasurable. I mean the book, it's five years later and it's still you know, it still sells. I mean, most books have two months to sell books and that's about Mm -hmm. it, you know, in today's, you know, publishing climate. So, yeah. um, Have have, have you met him since then? I don't want to think about what would have happened. We've exchanged a a ton of emails, but we've never met in person. Right. Cool. And uh, obviously you've settled on, on being a horror writer and I just wondered if that's the sort of genre that you enjoy uh, reading as well and whether also you know would you like to go back to writing something like phobia or something like that would you like to write in a different genre as well so i mean horror is definitely my first love and my main love i mean it's just where my interests go to um you know so even though i wasn't reading as a kid i was watching horror movies and being terrified of them <laughs> um so for me though so all, basically when i first started writing almost everything i wrote was a horror story and then at some point with, I had written a story that I sold and you know, a writer that I admire happened to read it and he was like, hey, this is a great story. It would have been great even without the horror elements, which is sort of an interesting comment to me. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, that, that helped me realize like, okay. And this to me was an important, I guess, step in my development as a writer. Um, I said, okay. So instead of saying, I'm Paul Tremblay, I'm a horror writer, like as a badge, I started thinking of myself as I'm a writer who who writes horror Mm -hmm. so to me that meant that i wasn't going to force every idea into being a horror story that meant that i was going to whatever the idea was whatever i was writing i was going to my job was to serve that story's needs and not try to make it into something that it wasn't um you know my 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 interests tend to be kind of i don't know you know dark and scary anyway so i mean things sort of go there but you know i never would have written phobia if i hadn't you know thought about writing that way i wouldn't have written you know certainly the detective novel um yeah i mean i think the book um i just started a new book you know there, there's definitely horror elements to it but i'm, I'm kind of hoping it's there'll be a little bit of humor to it and just an overall like odd book mm-hmm. <laughs> that maybe you know most people wouldn't necessarily think oh this is a horror novel so yeah i i definitely wouldn't mind you know writing in other genres again but I'm more than happy to continue writing horror too. Cause my, thankfully my editor and publisher kind of have like a broad definition or a broad, you know, how, how they look at what horror could be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you do do horror incredibly well. And, you know, even the, we'll, we'll get onto um, survivor song shortly, which is your, your new book, but um, the opening sequence in, in that is a very short scene in a house and it's you know there's not very much to it but it's very it's a very scary scene and and i, I kind of wondered if you had any hints or tips that you could share with people about how how do you effectively write a scary scene because I've, I've always thought that to scare people in a book is much harder than to yeah. scare people in a film in a film you can easily have quiet moments and loud music and jumpy cuts right. and stuff but <laughs> but in a book you're everyone's reading at a different pace you're you could be in a brightly lit room not in a cinema how, how do you scare people in a book um 
Yeah. I, I, it's a I'm thinking, I, I, no, no, no. I, I'm just thinking I wish I could do like, you know, the horror pop-up book. I would be reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that page. movie. Could, that is a great <laughs> idea. actually. <laughs> um, so it's, I, I, it's funny. I'm stumbling, but, uh, so I, I really typically try not to think about, is this going to be scary for somebody? Cause to me, you know, the scare isn't exactly what horror is to me. Also, I feel like what's scary is so subjective. Like what might scare you doesn't scare someone else. Just like uh, humor, right? What mm -hmm. someone else finds funny. I, mean, I think we, we can all intellectually be, oh yeah, that's supposed to be scary. That's supposed to be funny. But whether or not you have that visual reaction, I don't know. I feel like that's hard to con certainly control for everybody. So I tend to try to concentrate on um, being, you know, I feel like I can control more. Is it disturbing? Maybe it's a tense um you know because who knows if that scares somebody um so typically what i do is you know i try to st you know start build with the characters and really start from a place of empathy you know not sympathy to me that's there's a big difference between the two you know empathy is what makes this human empathy is the one to understand other people mm -hmm. you know and sympathy is sympathy is cheap sympathy is rooting for the home team sympathy is oh i like that person because they're just like me mm -hmm. um i mean i think the the job of fiction is is empathy but anyway so you know i try to start with with empathic characters um and more times than not especially the last couple books um i feel like i use sort of what alfred hitchcock talked about like you know letting the viewer know there's a bomb under the table mm -hmm. and just leaving it there mm -hmm. you know so maybe you know making you know with both books I, you know with survivor song you sort of you know if you if you have the cover but you sort of know what the story is about. I mean, it's almost like a little bit of the pre-story, right? You're, yeah. you know, it says horror. It's so in that first chapter, like, yeah, you have the sort of little bit of like a slow setup, although like more information starts to slowly leak out about, you know, what's happening in the town. And, you know, there's this weird rabies virus. So like, I think instantly most readers like can associate rabies with something terrible happening. So I think in that first set, uh, first chapter, as a reader, you, you go knowing, in, oh, something not good is going to happen. And sort of almost like the longer you, you hold that off, the more, hopefully the more suspension and the more tense mm -hmm. it feels. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I'm not sure. It's, a lot of it go, is by feel, I guess. And um, the, 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 that opening chapter of Survivor Song also has, uh, you know, it, it uses a, a Facebook post to sort of bring you into the world, which I thought was quite... Uh, a good way of of sort of bringing you up to speed with what is happening in the world and and the speed at the pace at which it's happening and all that sort of stuff without that issue of exposition and stuff like that it was it was a good technique to to do that it, i mean is that Thank some you. um yeah yeah i was just saying you know that first chapter well the the, the first part of any book always takes me the longest to write <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah because partly like because you really like this is the foundation um you know, as a writer, I can't skip ahead and write other stuff. I, I write it in the order in which I think it's going to happen. Um, so with the first chapter, I knew, I, you know, like, as you said, I had to sort of set some of the, you know, lack of a better term, world building boundaries of what's going on. Um, so I tried to be creative in how to do that. So I thought, you know, there's a almost like right away on page three, there's a list of Facebook comments on what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of info dumpy, but at the same time, you get a snapshot of how everyone is everyone else is reacting to what's happening and i hopefully thought that that would be sort of ring realistically that people would comment like this on facebook yeah and i thought i thought definitely especially with all the covid stuff that's going on so that's my door creepily swinging <laughs> a little bit unnerving <laughs> uh, with all, all the covid stuff that's happening um i, I it, it seems it was almost made more real because of that i've seen posts like that <laughs> you know last week type thing no absolutely i mean i feel like if anything i <laughs> um i should have people be like nastier on those facebook posts yeah i think that's right um, yeah yeah, and, given, and given what we see and what we know now, yeah, denying its existence in yeah. the face of it, yeah. Um, and your your writing style generally, you said that you did for for that novel, the first one, um, you did a summary for the little sleep. But uh, is that something that you do all the time? Do, you know, are you a big planner before you you start diving into a book? 
I would say most of the time. Um, a head full of ghosts. I did not write a summary for. I felt lucky with that one that the most of the story just sort of fell into my lap. Um, you know, I kept a little notebook and I would like maybe almost summarize as I go. So maybe, but you know, I would write and like, okay, what's going to happen next and take some notes. But, uh, you know, so for my other novel, it's like, well, Survivor Song, I didn't really write much of a summary. I really, it was like a three page summary, which is nothing. And it really only summarized like the first a hundred or so pages, like going to the hospital and stuff like that. And the rest of it was just like really like hand wavy, Mm -hmm. general stuff so it wasn't a very that one wasn't a very detailed summary um similar with cabinet at the end of the world i think i wrote i probably summarized like two-thirds of the book and the last third i said "Eh, we'll see what happens (laughs) (laughs) Um, and what happens once you've once you've written a draft you know do you do you redraft it straight away do you put it away for a month or so you know what's your plan Or, or do you tend to just kind of redraft as you go so it's ready by the time you finish it yeah i i redraft as i go um, you know, my goal is 500, 500 words and that, and that sort of goal line can move. Typically now I've, I've realized that in the early going of a novel, like I'm probably closer to three or 400 words. And then when I get toward the end, you know, I build up steam a little bit. And I'm hitting 500 much more frequently and maybe even more than 500. But before, like every day I start writing, I go back probably even to the beginning of the whole chapter and just go through and sometimes my new word count for that day is just me adding to what I had written yesterday mm-hmm. or, or the day before, you know, and, it, and sometimes it feels like, man, I'm never going to, you're never going to get there. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it adds, it, you know, it adds up if you can just do it like, you know, realistically, if I can do it five or six days a week, that's great. Um, you know, everybody still needs a weekend or two days yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, but by the, by the time I come to the end, you know, the draft is fairly clean, but, you know, I'll still print it out and go through it. Um, you know, because I'm fortunate I've had, you know, I've been with a publisher now for the last, so this is my sixth book with this, pub- no, fifth book with this publisher. Um, I have a built-in like time off because when I send in my draft to my editor, it usually takes her two weeks to a month to to come up with her comments, so it's a nice sort of built in time off from the draft. And when she gets it, that's when, when she sends me her edits, you know, that's the last time I'll change like big major things. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I have a little bit of a, a, a rhythm now, which is nice, you know, like I know sort of the, the steps to expect, but <laughs> still doesn't make it easier. It's like, you would think like after this is my eighth novel or eighth and a half that's been published. Yeah. You would think, Oh yeah, this next one's easier. And it's, <laughs> I don't know. It's the same, the same doubts. I mean, it's there that, okay, you finished, you know, you've done this before, you'll be able to do it again. Um, but no, those doubts are still there. If anything, um, it's, <laughs> they're intensified. I mean, do you, do you have that moment uh, when other authors we've spoken to have that sort of moment at sort of 40,000 words in or something where they sort of sit up, look at what they've got and where they are, and they're sort of, they doubt the whole thing suddenly. <laughs> it takes them a while to, to get over that sort of hump in the, in the road. Is that a sort no, of typical absolutely. thing for you? Yeah, the hundred page mark is usually my moment of existential crisis. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I've uh, I've I've given up on a few projects at the hundred page mark. To me, that's sort of like let's let's take stock, let's look at what's happening here. <laughs> um, yeah, once I hit forty thousand, that's actually a little bit of a sigh of relief because I'm like, oh, if I hit forty, it's officially a novel at this point. <laughs> mm. um, we'll just keep going. <laughs> And and I, I love the work that that you do your books you write in the in the present tense and is there, I wondered if there's it's kind of unusual choice for a lot of authors to make and I wondered is there a reason for that that you choose to write in that in that tense? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I love it. It just feels more immediate to me. Mm-hmm. You know, especially for the type of story that you're telling. Um, you know, I try to tell writers. You know, there's so much advice out there, and and all of it can be broken, and none of it should be prescriptive. But to go back to what I said earlier about like serving the story, like everything you do for your novel or your short story, there's no default setting. Like it has to be there for a reason. Like whether it's, you know, the point of view you choose is the first or third person or second person Mm -hmm. uh, to the tense. I mean, there should be a reason you should be able to, you know, you may not have, you may not be able to explain it like on the first page, but by the end of the story, you should be able to justify to yourself, okay, this is why this is in present tense or this is why you know, the timeline is not linear, et cetera. Um, 
So for me, uh, like I said, I find, especially, you know, for the story like Survivor Song, where it takes place essentially over four to six hours, I felt like it had to be present tense. Mm-hmm. You know, you ha- the reader needs to be there with, um, you know, with the characters as they're going through it. You know, same with Cabin at the End of the World. I think um, similar, like, compressed timeline. Um, <laughs> the lazy part of me who, you know, again, didn't study English literature, might say that writing in present tense makes it easier to, to go into past tenses without worrying about blue perfect and all the <laughs> all the grammar parts that I <laughs> all the grammar parts that I can't name. <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll pretend I didn't say. That. <laughs> and do you ever have a you know writer's block? Are you a believer in writer's block? And if you do, how how do you get through that patch? Um, yeah, I would I would never say I don't believe in it. Um, because you know, people I know writers who, I guess it's, I think it's like a very subjective sort of what is writer's mm-hmm. block. Uh, for me, the most helpful thing has been, I mean, even though it brings great stress to my life, <laughs> is that I have deadlines, contractual deadlines. Like for me, Disappearance of Devil's Rock was probably the, the hardest book for me to write. It was just, it just wasn't coming easy. Not that any of them ever come easy, but it felt like it was coming less easy and that I was second guessing every step. And there were days where I just didn't want to write, but it's like, I have to, this, you know, they've already paid me like some of the advance, you know, for this book, mm-hmm. I have to sit down and write it. Um, so I, I've found for me more times than not, like if I'm feeling like, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to do, writer's block, I want to quit and go watch TV. Um, if I just force myself to sit there, you, you know, say, all right, nope, I'm going to sit here for an hour and whether or not I write a word or not, I've sat in this chair for an hour and usually Within ten to fifteen minutes, my my stubborn subconscious gives up, <laughs> and then like you, you know I'm able to, to to get some stuff out. You know even if it's only a couple of hundred words. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Stuart and Ann, who's you know long time American novelist, amazing writer. You know he told me he used to he used to, he had a he used to have a belt around his chair at his desk, and he would literally like belt himself to his chair. <laughs> to force him to not get up you know he would set like i'm going to be here for this amount of time yeah whether anything happens or not because i'm tied to my chair um my favorite answer to writer's block though is stephen graham jones who definitely has never i don't think ever experienced writer's block because he just writes so much but he says he doesn't believe in writer's block he just said well he says writer's block means that you're oh i'm gonna blow it because it's such a great line um your standards are too high. You just need to lower your standards. If you have a <laughs> block, which I think is a great, a great way to think of it. And um, Survivor Song is, as we've as we've mentioned, your new book, and it is about uh, like an outbreak of rabies. You know, and so it's it's impossible to talk about that and not mention, you know, COVID stuff sure. that's going on right now. And 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 obviously, when you started writing the book, this wasn't a thing at all. Um, and and what impact do you think it will have in the book? You know, in terms of similarities to your storyline, or just in terms of the way that shops are slowly reopening? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, um, I know there are some people like I've I've read on you know on social media like, oh, I love Paul's stuff, but I can't read this book now, and I get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was certainly felt the same way in the early part of like March and April when, you know, when we when we in my state first went into to quarantine. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that, that book will never be read without, without, um, you know, the coronavirus like hanging over it or, you know, or like the weird sort of parallels in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I wish not just because of the book, you know, I wish we weren't going through this. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder like what, what people would think of the book, you know, if we weren't living in a pandemic, if the pandemic yeah. hadn't happened, um, yeah, so I don't know it's definitely been an odd experience with the book. Um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of like the medical sort of things that that line up weirdly were because of my sister, who's a nurse uh, at a big city hospital in Boston. Like she was, I leaned on her for a lot of research for the book. Mm-hmm. You know, so my anxieties for her are really tied up in like what's going on now. I'm, you know, I'm very concerned, you know, for her health. Um, you know, because she she and I are very close. So yeah, I don't know. I'm proud of the book, but is it's it has been like. <laughs> A weird thing I, i'd yeah. be happy if both you know if if someone said hey you know the book's gonna go away and to, in order for the coronavirus to go I'd like do it, do yeah. it now. <laughs> um, i mean do you think do you think you know the you sort of mentioned it earlier about the facebook post but you know having now 
gone through something or going through something like this, yeah. um, do you think that will change these types of stories in the future, the way that people tell them, uh, you know, or, you know, because one of the things that's, that struck me in real life is that, you know, you haven't had this, or you haven't had, in general terms, this uh, sort of societal collapse. Obviously, it's not as bad as, as the thing in your book, but, um, and generally, people are trying to help each other out a lot more than you see in that type of fiction. You know, it, right. it's much more um, everyone for themselves in that in that sort of fiction, the collapse of society type thing. So, I just wondered if you had any views as to whether in the future, if these stories are told, whether there will be any change or whether it will just become something that's in the past and you just tell the stories as they were kind of a thing. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt it'll change. I'm not quite sure how. Like, one of the things I wanted to do with Survivor Song, even in the earliest goings, like, I knew I didn't want to, and I, you know, I tell the reader in the book, this isn't a spoiler, you know, I tell the reader at some point in the book that this is not the end of the world, this is not the end of Massachusetts. And to me, that Hopefully that makes the story a little bit more, you know, poignant, and, you know, and potentially tragic for the characters who don't make it because if they could have just held out for, mm-hmm. or managed to hold out for another few weeks to a month, you know, you know, then they survived too. Um, you know, you're right. Like uh, about, you know, so, so I didn't want it like an apocalyptic novel that almost like lovingly, fetishistically described like you know, buildings destroyed mm-hmm. and, and people turning into cannibals within, you know, 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, most people are going to try to help each other. Um, on the flip side of it, you know, when you're online, all you see is the worst of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, a lot of it out there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, in, in my novel, I definitely have some sort of right wing conspiracy theorists who show up. So I didn't think that would be, I didn't think that would be uh, that wasn't hard to predict that some people would come up with conspiracy theories about the virus. Yeah, but you know, I I can't believe how like mainstream the politicizing of the <laughs> of the virus has become. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, although, again, I mean, you know, we're so caught up in our own time, which makes sense. This is the time we're living in. But like, if you go back and read, you know, to the like the Black Plague and you know in England, so- someone sent me an article about how. I forget what writer it was. It might have even been Chaucer. It was writing like, "Why are you knuckleheads going to the pub?" Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I think I saw that as <laughs> well. Know? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, I don't know. It's a weird balance where, like, it, you know, you, you almost try to soothe yourself that you know, society's been through this almost like every one hundred years, and the reaction to it in a lot of ways has been similar, where most people are going to, you know, try to act for the benefit of all, not just for themselves, but you know, the population is you know, there's so many more people now than there were previously. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just how information and misinformation spreads, you know, makes, you know, obviously makes what we're going through unique, you know, and more dangerous, I think. I think that's right. Although it is, it is funny, the, the sort of parallels, isn't there? I mean, we're kind yeah. of straying off subjects slightly here, but, but you know, it, it, like the, the reading about the 1918 thing, there was the anti-mask league and all this sort of stuff. So these things somehow do repeat, you know, the, the responses no. from society do repeat, even though they're maybe presented in a slightly different way, given the the state of yeah. society at the time. It, it, and they didn't have, you know, Facebook and Twitter no, to exactly, help yeah. spread the, the bad information. They just, right. you know, put, put a, you know, some kind of flyer up somewhere that said masks are for idiots and everyone said, cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you, you're... Uh, Going on to happier things, you have won a number of awards um, <laughs> for, for your books, and you're also on the board of the Shirley Jackson Award, I think, as well. Um, yes. w- what does what does that involve, being on the board there? So, I mean, it's funny. The, the award, geez, we've been going for like 13 years. Um, in a lot of ways, we're still, I feel like, a, a shoestring operation. It was just five of us that in so 2006 or 2007. Um you know, some of us had heard that the International Horror Guild was going away, um, which, you know, we really, I liked as a, an award. I thought it was nice to have, you know, I, just, I thought it was nice to have multiple awards. You know, there's the British Fantasy Society, obviously. Um, then there's, you know, the Stoker Awards. And, you know, I thought the International Horror Guild was sort of like a nice mix of the two. So some of us, we heard they were going away. Um, 
myself and John Lang and actually approached the IHG and said, Hey, if you guys are, are, um, not going to run the award anymore, do you want to let us do it? And they said, no, which I totally get now <laughs> at the time. I was like, you know, they didn't know us, you know, yeah. so like I get like, you're not going to hand over your awards. I'm like, all right, well maybe we should start our own award. And, um, so it was John Lang and myself, Sarah Lang and not related to John, but you know, she's a wonderful writer. Uh, F Brett Cox, um, is a writer in Vermont, writer, teacher in Vermont. And, uh, Joanne Cox is our administrator. And really she does so much of the work. She's really the award. It was just the five of us. And really the tipping point was getting permission from the Jackson estate to do it. I'm like, Oh, I guess we better do it then. <laughs> um, so in terms of what does the board do now? I mean, it depends. A lot of it is just like administrative stuff, just making sure we, you know, we pick jurors and stuff like that, and making sure, you know, the awards and stuff are actually made and got out to people. Um, that's about it. Yeah, you know, it's about, in, you know, we're going to start, you know, we're going to start like rotating and hopefully other people to be on the board very shortly. You know, just because, you know, some of us have been on it for mm -hmm. so long. I mean, the goal would be to be able to have this be a thing that can run itself, like that. The yeah. five of us don't have to to be there all the time um so we're, we're really going to start working toward that and also you know the board is you know all um you know cisgendered white people the five of us that started it so we're also going to really work towards you know diver diversifying our board as well mm -hmm. i mean it must be really satisfying to be able to you know choose to a certain you know extent books that you think haven't been maybe read enough or to or to give people a, a kind of platform or to give them a boost and to say this is a great piece of work which you know many people should read and give that a proper shot in the arm and that must be quite satisfying to see that book then do well because you've been able to push it out a bit more yeah and it's um and so it's really the, the jurors every year we have five jury uh five jurors you know and they they have to do a ton of reading <laughs> it, it increases every year you know yeah. they just get sent books by publishers and you know, links to short stories so you know as far as like the who who gets the award that's all the jury that particular year you know that they just you know the board does no deciding about okay you know who gets oops who gets the award or not i just dropped my phone <laughs> um so that's i mean that for me, me that besides the response to the award which is very nice one of the more satisfying parts is having writers and editors you know give up their free reading time for a significant part of the year mm -hmm. You know, to donate their time to just to read everything because they believe in the horror genre and they believe it's healthy and they believe it's you know a big a big genre with all sorts of different approaches and different ways to write a horror story so to me that that's the coolest part nice uh, and it, it must be good as well you know so sort of writing writing is obviously something that, that we all love doing but it is quite a solitary thing a lot of the time so is, do you find it important to have these other things to do as well, or do you find them a distraction from from the writing? Um, I would say a little of both. I mean, I, I cherish my friends, you know, many of whom are other writers, you know, and they they honestly they help sustain me. Um, I do enjoy going to conventions, um, you know, and the online stuff too. I you know, the, there's like the weird give and take of social media. You know, mm -hmm. social media has revolutionized really politics and how, you know, giving a voice to people that didn't have it before. Um, but at the same time, you've got, you know, trolls and misinformation. Um, in the writing world, you know, I've been able to meet people I never would have met otherwise through social media. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, like, you know, I, I try not to read <laughs> reviews of my stuff. But if you're active on social media, it's almost impossible not to. It's almost impossible not to even like when you're not trying to like people yeah. like tagging you in their bad reviews and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. I don't know that it's easy to say to somebody, "Hey, you know, you got to build a thick skin and let that bounce off." But <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's, I've I've never quite understood yeah. that because it's one thing to to write a review and say I didn't like this book and then put it out there and then as you say, if you want to read that, you can then go and find that and you can say, "What do folks think about my book?" Oh, this guy didn't like it. Oh, well, that's fine. But to actually, yeah, it's like to actually tag you in it and to say, "Hey." Paul, I, I don't like your yeah. book, and, and and here's here's why, and actually send it to you. you know, it's like, well, don't. I yeah, don't no, it's like sending you a letter saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a very yeah. bizarre. I, I don't quite understand why you need to draw the author or the creator into that into your view. You know, just it's, yeah, it's very odd. No, it is. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to I don't know individual versus society, where like 
I'm lumping in the indiv- you know, the people who are uh, me, 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 and you know, the individual comes mm-hmm. first. They're going to be the ones not wearing masks. They're, they're going to be, ta- <laughs> they're going to be the ones tagging you in their, you know, negative reviews. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah, and I don't know, like everything. I think you know, the experience of coronavirus is, you know, in quarantine is you know, sort of changing, <laughs> changing my view on things, um, on a whole ho- host of things. You know, for, from big to small, including like. You know, I miss seeing my friends in conventions, but at the same time, you know, having, I'm very fortunate to be home with, you know, with Lisa and both my two kids. And it's actually, it's been, it's been wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm going to be much, much less likely to, to just like jet off every weekend in the summer to conventions. You know, I've been quite busy with book stuff the last few summers, which has been wonderful. Um, but I don't know, just, uh, <laughs> I can feel myself like leaning into the, stay at home lifestyle more and more yeah, <laughs> yeah. i suppose this, this kind of thing always makes you realize what's actually you know what what means a lot to you and what means most to you and for a lot of people that's probably is like it's family and it's what's what's right in front of you as opposed to stuff that you know you can do from your home and your computer you don't need to be there in person or whatever that it does change people's views i think on what what actually matters yeah um and even like i mean social media it's it's almost like impossible to become like if you're a new writer like if you, you know, sign a, a deal with a publisher, they're, the publisher is going to expect that you're going to be active online. It's almost like mm-hmm. um, a required part of the gig, um, which is tough. And it can be frustrating because, you know, some people, and I wish I, some people don't want to do that. And I totally get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, being on the internet and social media, I mean, changes your brain. Like I, I feel, I know, like there are times when I'm writing, I feel like, man, you know, and some of that is just the doubts, but, you know, I start worrying out because of all this time I'm spent online. Like, I feel like I'm not writing as well as I used to or, or what. So I don't know. It's a weird balance. And, you know, I certainly don't have it. There are certainly days where I spend way too much time online. And if I'm able to pull myself away, I definitely feel better. So, yeah, I don't know. Got to find, you know, there's a very few writers who, I don't know, like Cormac McCarthy and, you know, have no online presence at all. Yeah. And still manage to yeah. sell mm-hmm. books. I don't know. Maybe that's my dream someday. <laughs> <laughs> And have you, would you always just want to continue writing novels or have you ever had a desire to write a screenplay or graphic novel or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tried writing a screenplay in like December. So yeah, I'm dipping my toe into that a little bit. Cool. Um, I, I love comics. I, should, I would have no idea how to do it. So, you know, mm-hmm. I don't want to feel like for both screenwriting and like writing a comic script. I mean, I, I would never be so arrogant to think of, oh, I can, I can do that. No, it's, to me, that's like a whole other format. That yeah. You would have to, you know, spend a long time learning and how to do it properly. And I don't know, when I think back to writing novels, like, yeah, I don't want to write like four and a half screenplays before I can write a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I would say most likely if I'm going to try anything new, it's probably more screenwriting stuff. Cool, cool. And what's what's next then? I think I'd read that I know some of your work has been been or the has been optioned for, to be turned into TV or film. Is that is that happening still? Yeah, Head Full of Ghosts is probably the closest. I mean, it's been optioned for five years, so they've had it for a long time. Okay. Um, and at this point, they're really just looking for a window within the pandemic to maybe be able to film somewhere because they've got a lot of stuff in place. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so, so that's last. You know, they wanted to try filming the summer. But with the spikes where they wanted to film, that's obviously not going to happen this summer. So maybe oh, in the fall like they might start. They, but they're obviously quite quite far along in the sun. They've got the cast and the scripts and everything done. Yeah, I think they have, you know, I, don't, I think that, well, they've got some of the cast. They've got the director, Scott Cooper. You know. Um, oh, brilliant. Yeah, they had a screenplay from, from Osgood Perkins that I think, you know, Scott Cooper is either rewriting or retweaking. Um, like it's you know it's less artsy thing to say but like they have like foreign distribution money deal signed already which you know for movies that's like a big thing i guess mm-hmm. um yeah so we'll see i don't know it's been so long you know i, I won't i mean it's exciting to talk about think about but i won't celebrate till the day they start so, filming yeah, <laughs> yeah <fair enough. laughs> hopefully it happens yeah um and what about uh you said you were working on the on the next book um how how far along are you with that um so I'm a, I've written like 60 or so pages and I do have a, a summary you know, that I use to pitch to my, to my publisher. So there might be some sort of 
public announcement about that book coming soon. Cool. Um, nice. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll see. It feels like starting over again in a way, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What was the last book that you read? Uh, I just finished uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia's Mexican oh, Gothic. Yeah, I've yeah, read a lot about that. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I'm in the middle of reading, it's not out yet, but Jeremy Robert Johnson's The Loop. Cool. Um, I think that comes out in the fall. And that's quite nice. fun. Quite cool. uh, the gory fun so far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was the last film you watched? Oh, no. What's the last movie I watched? Oh, um, it was a rewatch. I watched it with my son, uh, Blade Runner. Oh, nice. He, nice. he had never the, he had never seen it. So the the first one or the or the second? The first one, yeah. First one, nice. Well, on the decision with the first one is: do we watch the theatrical release? Do we watch yes. the yeah, no. first director's <laughs> cut or do we watch the final cut? Um, we probably should run with the final cut because the theatrical release has like a goofy voiceover that. When I first watched it, I remember not being bothered by it, but watching it now, it's like, ooh, yeah. That doesn't I know, it's funny, because that's, that's the version I saw when I was young, and mm -hmm. it's always stuck in my head as one that I want to see again, but I've never, you know, everyone's like, the final cut, and the one that I've got on Blu-ray is the final cut, but final cut, yeah. um, I would like to see the theatrical cut again, just to, although, as you say, it'll probably come across much, much <laughs> more badly than it than i remember but although i mean yeah. the the whole all the voiceover stuff that that does fit the the mold of that kind of noir story you it know does, yeah. but but from what I, I can't i've definitely seen that cut at some point when i was younger but i can't remember but i definitely read that it, you know ford basically phoned it in and didn't want to read it and so i think you know the, it didn't doesn't land very well which is which is a shame but um yeah yeah no like you hear like he, film. yeah i mean rewatching it listening to it yeah it, it, it his voiceover sounds strange like mm -hmm. doesn't you know, it sounds like bad acting almost. Yeah, yeah. And then reading about it, I was like, oh, the studio put that in there because they were worried that people wouldn't know what's going on. So especially in the beginning, it's just him explaining to you what, what has yeah. happened, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, um, what was the last TV show that you watched or are watching at the moment? So I finished Fleabag oh, over cool. the weekend. Oh, nice. What your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I really liked it. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was fun and sad. The second season was less sad more fun yeah <laughs> uh but no i really enjoyed it you know i pretty much watched the second season friday night with with a bunch of beer i don't drink <laughs> beer all that often but I, uh, <laughs> and uh the whole the whole house is in the middle of a rewatch of avatar the last airbender oh right i've um, never watched that show but i've heard so many folk going about it it's meant to be it's excellent. really good yeah it, it is it's oh it's a nice bright piece of hope <laughs> in the middle of sort of what we're doing now and um yeah, so I mean that's been enjoyable. Like, you know, my son is going to be twenty in a couple months, so you know he loves that show and watched it when he was like, you know, six, seven, eight years old. Mm. So he already rewatched it once. Now he's rewatching it again with us. <laughs> <laughs> I take it he's probably not a fan of the uh, of the film version, which I've heard uh, is absolutely dreadful. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely terrible. Um, and the the very last thing we do is a quick fire either or. So um, I always tell people there's no right or wrong answers, but I mean. Okay throwing at some of the answers so, <laughs> so uh, first of all Stephen King or Joe Hill Stephen King sorry Joe <laughs> <laughs> um, Paranormal Activity or Midsommar oh it's so easy uh, Paranormal Activity Oh, I hate okay. I hate Midsummer like poison poison oh really why is that don't get me started oh, I it was... <laughs> oh no do it oh <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's funny. So I mentioned my friend John. I don't know if you've read John's work, but uh, the novel The Fisherman is amazing. Um, he and I, we were actually going to a, a local convention and uh, we went and saw Midsummer first. And I'll just tell you that when when it was over, he could tell I didn't like it because he said I was looking at my watch through half the movie. <laughs> Uh, I said to him, I was like, I hate that. In the moment, I hated the movie so much, I wanted to quit writing horror. Oh, really? <laughs> Why? What was, I, I, I have to see. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, have you seen... Well, let me ask you first. Have you seen The Wicker Man? Yes. The original? Uh, at some point, I think I have. I can't... Oh, well, I'm not entirely... I've yeah, seen the it, Nicolas Cage remake, uh, which uh, is the most no, important... That's terrible. Of the, uh, <laughs> no. my, my big thing was, I was actually on board with the movie for most of the first hour. But once, like, the old couple kills themselves, I thought the movie just went off the rails. And mainly because 
these supposed smart graduate students just started doing idiotic things. Mm -hmm. um, like really, the, the guy is going to go in and take flash photography in the special scroll room. You know, <laughs> like no one, no one will know he's there when the flash is going on. And had, had, had none of these graduate students ever read about pagan societies and never ever once were worried about anything going on. And I felt there was no narrative tension because I knew how it was going to end. I mean, having seen Wicker Man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, there's <laughs> just a lot of things I didn't like. About it, so. <laughs> but I know I, I'm apparently in the minority of, of, <laughs> of its viewership. Um, so anyway, Paranormal Activity. I enjoyed that movie. That's okay. a great film, yeah. Uh, that, yeah. What about uh, TV or cinema? Uh, even though I watch way more TV, cinema, cinema feels like a treat. Like, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah. Especially if I, you know, I, you know, when we get to go to to the movies again, um, so that's like an event. Like, I get excited for it. You know, TV yeah. is just sort of always there. Yeah. Uh, and the last one, uh, real book or ebook real uh I, i'm not the same reader i'm not the same reader digitally and that's you know it's a me thing i know i just much prefer and that's part of me i don't know old gen x person i like physical objects <laughs> uh, that's I, it. I still i still miss cds <laughs> T -t Tarek is always disappointed because everyone chooses real yeah. book i'm afraid that's two wrong <laughs> answers you gave us there. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> do, do i get a passing grade then? Get... We'll, we'll pass you but barely it's, yeah it's okay. So that shows that you can become a successful author even when you're not into reading very much uh, until <laughs> exactly. until quite late on, really. I think you know. I know. I know. Is it not not the typical sort of kind of background that you imagine? You know, although you can have always imagined an author has been extremely bookish. And, yeah, exactly. You know, very very into that kind of scene from a young age. But no, exactly. You can get into you know. That's the wonderful thing about writing is that you can start at any time. It's very cheap entry. You know, a pen and paper really is all is all you need, and and that's and that's it, and it's it is open for anyone to get into. Yeah, absolutely, and also interesting that you know it took him a while to find the agent, and then when he found the agent, the agent said, "This is good, but write another book because we're not going to sell this one." <laughs> you know, which, to hear, yeah, it. exactly. I mean, that that is you know when you when you get an agent, you must be thinking, uh, you know, your first thought is great, I'm going to get this published, <laughs> and then to be told to kind of start again <laughs> start is is kind again. of demoralizing. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK Page One, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm -hmm.